Genesis 35 is where we are today. Um, I've entitled it, Get Back to Where You Once Belong. Those of you who know good music know uh, that's a Beatles, you know, a line from a Beatles tune. There are a couple of other songs that are in the country genre that popped in my mind, such as Happiness Was Lubbock, Texas, In My Rearview Mirror, or Bobby Bear's Tulsa Time. They talk about someone going back to where they had once left. And so that's kind of the underlying theme uh, today. Both of those guys, being Mac Davis and Bobby Bear, uh, came back home realizing that they never should have left in the first place. And some of us have to come to that conclusion. I'm not necessarily talking about geographically, but spiritually. I found that there are generally two types of folks from where I come from back in Mississippi, and that is those that love it and want to stay there, and then there are those that can't wait to leave, and uh, they tend to be of the younger persuasion. Uh, but as you get older, you tend to realize that there's no place like home. Uh, most people know me. My wife will tell you I'm a homebody. I like to be at home. I like to be comfortable in, in my surroundings, in my chair, and, you know, going and doing stuff. See, you have opposites attract. When we go on vacation, my thinking is I want to rest. I want to sleep as late as I want, watch television, read, eat, take a nap, get up, and start all over again. <laughs> my wife, on the other hand, has an itinerary that for years in advance she has gone through and researched and logged all this stuff and has it down to the minute, what we're going to do, where we're going to be, and how. And then so I've got to come home to get a break from vacation. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're just opposite that way. But I'm one of those, I just, I want to rest, you know. I know a lot of people don't realize it, but having to think requires a lot of energy. Some people like Don don't know that because he's never had to think. <laughs> also, while I'm thinking about it, so you were given, uh, Kathy gave you a little red, uh, green, excuse me, thing, uh, yeah, a study in context. How many, if it, any of y'all already read it? Don will get some, uh, Kathy will read it to you later. <laughs> no pictures to color. But uh, um, now, now I shouldn't have said that because everybody's going to be reading it and not listening to it. But uh, read it, and uh, I'm just interested in your feedback. Yeah, there's a purpose to it. I'm not launching a publishing career. The copyright in the front is really bogus. <laughs> Mary Lou just put that in there to fill up a page. So um, anyway, yeah, there's a purpose to it. <clears throat> but as we get into Genesis 25, uh, 35, I should say, Jacob finally gets the realization that he should have, that he's back where he should have been the entire time. You may recall that Jacob left Bethel earlier to go to the big city of Shechem, and there his daughter was assaulted, and his sons murdered all the men in the city. Jacob disobeyed God and paid the price for it. Not only did he pay the price, but his family also. Now he's returning to where he was supposed to be in the first place. Now remember that this comes on the heels once again of Dinah's assault the slaughter of the men at Shechem. And Jacob was scared of being killed by the other city-states and tribes in the regions because of the actions of his sons. But let's look at what blessings await us when we are actually where God wants us. Verse 1 says, And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods, little g note, which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. Now... The earring deal, that is not a prohibition on earrings, okay? This is a cultural thing. Those earrings they were wearing were part of pagan worship, all right? So ladies, wear all of them. 
All the earrings that you want, okay? That's fine. Guys, you know, well, <laughs> different generation. Anyway, you know, well, I remember the first guy that ever wore an earring at my school, and back then the rule was left was right and right was wrong. We had this guy from, we would say, Chicago, and he was supposed to be bad. And he was the first guy to ever wear his earring. I remember going to the restroom during class one day, and he was crumpled up in the corner, and he had had his earring forcefully removed. That's a true story. Um, wasn't too long he went back to Chicago, but uh, he was supposed to be some bad dude, you know, and he was trying to make a... That has nothing to do with any of this, <laughs> but it, it popped into my head. So I don't care, you understand, but... Uh, so, but I do know there are certain people that read a line like this and think there's automatically this, this prohibition on men wearing earrings or any of the other sorts of things that go on. I don't care. You have to understand the context. This was cultural. What they were wearing was for pagan worship. So this is not a blanket prohibition on men or women, okay? So I want you all to understand that. Um, no more than... Corinthians talking about braided hair is a prohibition on braided hair. You got to know the context. And that little green thing that, that we handed out will help you understand that. Anyway, um, each time Jacob was in great distress, God spoke to him. He does us the same way. We don't hear him sometimes because we aren't listening. We're either too busy or we simply don't listen for his voice. Uh, many times, though, God isn't telling us something new. He's simply repeating something he has said earlier that he's already told us. And in this case, he tells Jacob to go back to where he had spoken with him the last time. Now, God tells him to go back and build an altar there. Once again, if you've been with us, you understand that building an altar was considered an act of worship. It commemorated and sanctified or it set apart the place and the occasion and to the Eastern mindset, to the Hebrew, to any of the, the, pagans around, the pagans around there, the ground on which something happened was holy. You would keep it. It was consecrated. It was set apart. That monument that they stood up meant something holy happened here, and it really meant something. It wasn't just a piece of real estate. It actually meant something. This was the same place where he's commemorating. It's the same place that God had comforted Jacob when he was worried about being killed by his brother. So it has some special significance for him. The next question is whether or not Jacob will obey. Now he does, but he doesn't decide to just get up and leave. Something had to be done before they left. Verse 2, once again, Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with them, servants, uh, you know, soldiers, shepherds, everybody, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. Now, I don't know how long Jacob stayed outside the city of Shechem, but it, had, it did have a profound effect on his family. As we can see here, they were worshiping false gods. Some of this, I'm sure, was picked up from Rachel, as we saw back in chapter 31, who had carried these uh, little statues, statuettes, and brought them home from, uh, from her home uh, town and brought them with her and she hid them and all this kind of stuff. And archaeology shows that uh, they were often buried under a house in order to bless and protect the house and this sort of thing. But the point is, because now it has infected the whole family, that the kids picked up what was being shown them in the home as well as gleaning from the environment outside the home in which they were placed. And as parents, we cannot take this responsibility lightly because more is caught than taught. You can tell them all you want. Do as I say, not as I do. That does not work. You know, I heard that one time from a golf pro as he drove across a putting green. I said, Joey, what are you doing? Do as I say, not as I do. You know, not good. You don't do that. We are to shelter our children as much as we can, and there's some balance there. But you can't keep them from everything. You can't keep them from a great deal. But it's when they begin to see, here we go, pay attention to this, especially with all the social media and Internet and all that, television and all. It's when they begin to see the abnormal or the aberrant 
as the everyday thing that they become desensitized to it. Yeah. You know, a hundred years ago or a little longer, I was told uh, by my football coach, he said, you know, people would come to town about once a week. And they would park around the, you know, courthouse and you went and did all your shopping. He said, and then guys would kind of congregate around the hood of a car and ladies wore, you know, long dresses back then. He said, and they'd watch the ladies walk up the steps to the courthouse. And they got this big Mary Poppins looking dress on, you know, like, what's up with that? He said, they were hoping to see an ankle. Because that's all you could see. Well, now it's all the way up to the imagination. You know, and so people it, it become somewhat desensitized to it. You know, you walk by, and, and if you're from an older generation, you know, I can remember Nancy Sinatra walking around in that plastic miniskirt. These boots are made for walking. And that was, ooh. You know, now that miniskirt's not a miniskirt anymore. That's a wedding gown. Uh, <laughs> but things change. But they're going to see, your children are going to see and hear things, but they should see them and hear them these things as no, abnormal, not necessarily as normal. Does that make sense? There should be a distinction between right and wrong. You set that line as a parent. Hopefully you do it by, what, by the biblical standards. But what we see here is Jacob's family had been tainted by Rachel's idols and the neighborhood in which they lived. They were living in a mixed message. And the children were being sent conflicting signals. So at this point, they're told to put away their strange gods, to be clean, and change their clothes. Now, this is, you know, more symbolic than anything else. Clothes were seen as a measure of character and, of course, as wealth in the Bible. That ought to make sense. That's still the same thing today. You know what I mean. Some folks dress casually, comfortably. Some dress more conservatively. Some wear suits and all that's fine. Some dress hoochie is the word we use back home, or thug-like, what have you, and now everybody gets a uh, show out. There's a reason you are told when you go for a job interview to, jo to dress a certain way, you know. There's a reason you are supposed to carry yourself a certain way. It takes, if it takes you 30 minutes to walk from the door to, to your seat, you're probably not going to get a job, you know, if you're... You know, when you're slouch. I mean, that's just the way it is. That says something. Oh, now you're judging someone. Yeah. The Bible says make a righteous judgment. Now we, the, the, the most famous quote in the Bible, rather than John 3.16, is what it used to be, is do not judge. Well, read the rest of it. Make a righteous judgment. You've got to make a judgment. Do you send your children to home with these people or not? They might be cannibals. I don't know. Do you send your child home? Well, that's making a judgment. When you pull into a parking lot, do you pull in next to the very nice Mercedes car or, or, or high dollar car that is pristine? Or do you pull it in next to this car that folks have been every corner on it and look like they've used in a demolition derby? They're probably not going to care when their kid slams their door into the side of yours. That's making a judgment. All right? When your daughter brings home a date, does he look educated and clean and all this? Or does he look like he's been living under a bridge and won't be able to support her for the rest of his life? Think about that. That's making a judgment. All right? So get your PC ideas out of this. There you are told to make a judgment. Just not a prejudicial one based on something that's not a biblical guideline. So... You want to make a certain impression, and your clothes make an impression whether you want to admit it or not. And in culture, those things change. Now you can wear jeans and a nice shirt to an interview. You didn't dare do that when I was growing up. All right? You just didn't do that. You dressed at least like this, no matter what you were doing. You know, no matter if you're going to go for a ditch digger job, you still had to dress nice somewhat to go get the job most of the time. All right? That's changed. It's more casual now. That's fine. I understand that. But Jude 23 gives this idea of spiritually changing your clothes. It says, Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. All right? This is talking about the garment here. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. 
gives a similar exhortation that says that you put off concerning, concerning and here the analogy is your former conduct to uh, what you're wearing, this, and it is an analogy, uh, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And in the Greek, there's this idea that once you're saved, you put on a new man or woman. You know, it's like shucking the old clothes and putting on something new. It's a fresh start is what they're getting at here. And that's the idea that we get from Genesis. You're 35. So Jacob wanted everyone to start fresh and new, as does God wanting us to do the same thing upon salvation. Now the question is, will they do it? Because you know, there are some things we kind of want to hold on to. All right? Look at verse 4. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. And thus so they did obey at this time, at least externally. We still don't exactly know the heart. You can't judge the heart by what you see on the outside. Once I see, you know, you see all these guys with the crosses hanging around their necks and they're liable to just slaughter people. I mean, that's just, you know, that's just the way it works. Everybody wants to wear a cross or have one tatted up here, and that's fine. But that doesn't mean you're a Christian, all right? So just because you see the guy on the album covering ah, with a big cross, you know, when he's singing, rah, 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 kill your mother, you know, he's probably not, you know, a Christian, all right? So, have a little discernment. So, now, as you may recall, Jacob was worried about having to travel after being involved in the, in the slaughter at Shechem. There's a lot of extra biblical material on who actually was act, trying to, to chase him down, hunt him down, and all this as he moved. We don't find it in the Bible, but you do read it in extra biblical material. There were folks after him, but God protected him. But he has to go. Even though he's worried about traveling, he had to go. And it can be a scary thing sometimes walking in God's will or trying to get back to that place that we know is God's will. People will attack you and they'll say you're crazy. And, uh, but the move has to be made. And we have to make that move. We have to. It's, it's, it's hard sometimes because we get comfortable in our homes as a homebody. But you do have to get up and move sometimes. Oftentimes we find that there's nothing to our greatest fear once you confront it, it's that the devil uses our fear to paralyze us. The deer in headlights, you know, the, what is it, the flea or free, well, I don't know what they call that, and, you know, fight or flight. Yeah, there you go. You know, and it's, it's pretty simple. If you look at that guy and you know you can't whoop in, the option is to run. You think I got a shot at this? You got a gun, he's got a knife, go ahead and fight. You know, it's just very simple, not rocket science. But God, have, God put a fear on the surrounding people and they left Jacob alone. Now, we have to remember that this mission, this, this uh, trip that Jacob is on is God's mission. It's his plan and that he will see that it is accomplished. God's grace protected Jacob, not because he was perfect. We've been reading the story. They are very dysfunctional as dysfunctional as most any modern reality show can be. But he's, he's, God protected him not because he's perfect, but because he was chosen. And if you are saved, you've been chosen also. Now, don't come up to me asking me about predestination and all that kind of stuff. There are two sides of that coin, and just because I say you are chosen does not mean that we believe in predestination the way that the Calvinists do. So don't how corner me out there after the service thinking I'm a Calvinist because I'm not in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Now, we're going to see that just because we are in God's will, and that is where the way Jacob is moving, we are not immune to tragedy. Look at verse 6. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, another name for the place, he and all the people that were with him. And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. But Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died 
and she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak, and the name of it was called Alam Bakuth. So once Jacob got back to Luz, he built the altar and called it El Bethel, which literally means El in Hebrew is God. So Beth means house. So this literally means God, house of God. That's what the word literally means. But then Deborah dies suddenly. This is a setback. And I'm sure she's been part of the family for a long time. She is, uh, you know, an integral part of it. Being in God's will does not immunize us from tragedy. I don't care what they tell you on TBN. It does not. What it does do is it allows us to cope with tragedy and it allows us to put things in perspective, in an eternal perspective, rather than in our little uh, microcosm world in which anything that is a setback is, comes down to woe is me. So they take her, they bury her under an oak, called it Alam Bakuth, which means oak of weeping. And then at this point in verse 9, God appears to Jacob again. It says, And God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac to thee, I will give it. And to thy seed after thee will I give the land. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. And Jacob set a pillar. This is not the same type of pillar you sleep on. <laughs> in Mississippi, it's a pillar. And you have winders in your house. And you wash your dishes and wrench them off. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone. There you go. See, you know I'm right now. And he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil, oil thereon. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him Bethel, house of God. So God speaks with Jacob once again to reaffirm his promises to him. He wanted to let Jacob know that he was on the right track, and everybody needs a pat on the back and all that, that sort of thing from time to time. God does the same thing to us uh, today. Now, once again, God said nothing new. This is not any sort of new revelation. He is, God is simply reaffirming what he has already promised. He also made sure that Jacob knew his new name. It's Israel, which is where the nation gets its name today. From this family right here comes that nation. Now, Jacob then poured out a drink offering and called the name of the place Bethel, meaning house of God. And that's, once again, is commemorating this place. This is a sacred and holy place. Now, for us, we don't normally do that sort of thing nowadays, but we've all left some place. You left home this morning to get here unless you're living on the premises and I'm not aware of it. We have had that happen. Someone was living back there in the woods and the water bill was just going sky high because they had running water right off this hose running down through the woods. But we've all left some place. You left home to get here today. We will all return to some place because y'all don't need to stay here all day. You understand. But most of us will return home today at some point what we can't afford to leave and not return to is God's will. Now, I, I, we all, including me, do that. We step off the train from time to time. All right? But God's will for you may be a certain place. It might be a certain job. It might be a certain relationship. It could be a calling on your life. We can't leave our first love as the church in the book of Revelation did. We have to have that same zeal for God, and I understand that you can't manufacture this. I know some people try to hoop you up and get your praise on and do all that kind of stuff. That's fake. The fruit of the Spirit is, is real, you understand. You can, you can have real fruit on the coffee table or you can have the plastic kind. Now, only one kind will, nurture, will uh, uh, nourish you. You understand that. You can try to eat all the plastic apples and oranges and bananas you want. Doesn't work too well. Also not too healthy for the digestive tract. But the point is, that's man-made fruit. So anything we do to try to... It's one thing to try to be a conduit to assist you 
in the worship of God and to teach you and to try to help you find that peace. It's another thing to scream it into you, have the drummer and the keyboard trying to whip you up into something because that's going to wear off soon after you drive out of the parking lot and that first person cuts you off in traffic. (laughs) It's bad enough just trying to get out of here. Because Satan stands out there and makes sure that each car coming from every direction is perfectly spaced. (laughs) And as soon as you get, ha, there's nobody coming, you look, and here they come. (laughs) And unless you're on one of those rice rockets, you're not going to get in traffic. So, uh, you know, anything that's man-made like that can go away. We can't lose our first love. We have to have that same zeal for God we had the first day we were saved. Now, that's because we appreciated it. And you felt the, the burden come off and that sort of thing. All right? But we don't live by feelings alone. You're going to have a hard life if that's the way you do. If you run on with your emotions on your sleeves and, and, and you move back and forth like that, you're going to have a hard life. I'm just here to tell you. And like John Wayne said, life is hard. It's even harder if you're stupid, all right? So don't be stupid, but don't be overly emotional is what I'm trying to say. So if you've left something, someone, or some place where God wants you, then I pray you get back there today because God will bless you and protect you in that journey. We move now into the second part of this chapter that's a little bit different It's uh, than the, any of the previous chapters. Uh, chapter 36 is the same way. The second half of chapter 35 is not a, a regular narrative as we've been reading for the most part. It doesn't flow like your normal story. Rather, it's a series of statements that seem to be somewhat, I would term them open-ended. These open-ended statements tend to leave out many details. And you'll see that the responses to these statements that are made seem to be missing sometimes. And as you will see, they aren't really missing They just aren't answered here in this chapter. You'll find these answers if you're really looking. You'll find them later on in the book of Genesis. Tales, did my mic go out? Or what is that? Hello, can you still hear me? All right. Abe was on Verizon earlier. That's why you couldn't hear him. Details are important to God. The issues which seem to be overlooked are not forgotten, but they are dealt with in God's time. In his timing. We want it now. You know, we, have, we are running and we want to get up and God to run on our schedule. That ain't happening. I can tell you that right now. If you're one of those people that has their whole day lined out and any little curveball thrown to you, I'm not one of those people. I learned a long time ago. There's going to be a lot of curveballs thrown at me. So I just have that Bruce Lee theology. You know, when they expand, I contract. When they contract, I expand. Roll with the flow. It's going to change. And if you're one of those people that has to have it just like this, and then your world goes away when it doesn't, hey, that's life. Get used to it. Once again, life is hard. You know the B portion. All right. So we need to remember that the issues which seem to be overlooked are not forgotten, that God deals with them in his timing. In the first half of chapter 35, Israel, or Jacob, attempted to get his family back on track. They all give up their idols. We've seen all that. Um, God provided the protection for Israel and his family. And then he goes back and God reaffirms the the promise and the plan. Now, after the family settled in, Israel journeys south to reunite with his father Isaac. Hasn't seen him in decades. The last half of this chapter deals with the happenings of that journey. It ends with Esau, excuse me, with Israel, yeah, and Esau burying Isaac. These are brothers. Now, though this section is a little different, it doesn't make for the greatest reading if you're just if you're one of those that wants to follow the story. We can still mine some nuggets of truth from it. We're going to do that in the next 16 minutes, we're going to, we hope. Verse 16, Then they journeyed from Bethel, and when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had hard labor. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, You have this son also. Now, y'all are acquainted with these midwives if you watch that on Netflix called The Midwife. I've watched the whole series now. Uh, (laughs) Waiting on the next one. It's a period piece. Come on. I don't care to see five babies born every episode, but uh, it's a period piece. I like the formality of the British. 
So anyway, so it was, verse 18, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem, different name from Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day, a headstone as it were. So the family heads south to Hebron to see Isaac just before they get to Bethlehem. Um, Rachel goes into labor and she has hard labor and passes away. But before she dies, she names the boy Benoni, which means son of my pain or son of my misfortune. Don't hang that on your kid. <laughs> you know, think about it. You might think you're giving them this great, awesome name. It might even be a family name. But if it's going to get them beat up on the playground, don't do that. If it's going to take them, like in my case, if you're going to have to be sixth grade before you can spell it because it's this long, you might want to rethink that, you know. And if you want to give them a biblical name, research that name. Because I've heard some names you think, that was a pagan king. Why do you want to name your, your kid after that? So do some research, you know. And make sure it's not like Sennacherib, you know, <laughs> or, you know, or Zerubbabel or something. You know, the kid's going to get hammered on the playground. Don't do that. So if you remember, Rachel had been in what we call, what I called an arms race or a baby race with her sister Leah because they each wanted to have more sons than the other in order to gain the love and respect of Jacob and as the community. That's the way a, a, a lady built her street cred was by the number of children she had, especially if they were boys. So she names him Benoni. You know, I think she knew she was going to die, and that's when she gives him that, that name. Uh, like I said, I don't know how wise it is to hang that on your child, but Benjamin thought better of it and said, no, we're going to put something else on the birth certificate. Let's call him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. Now, if you study the Bible, that phrase, the right hand, is very important. All right, It has a meaning. It's not just he's right-handed or he's standing on this side of his daddy or anything else. Exodus 15, 6, you see, your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. We see that the Lord is our strength and honor. Psalm 16, 8 says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand I shall not be moved. Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, which is the position of strength and honor, and we sit there with him. So it's, theologically, it's very important. If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, Colossians 3, 1, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. So this is what that name means. And as it turns out, this birth was a fulfillment of prophecy I'll go back to chapter 30 right quick, verses 20, starting verse 23, and we can see what happened at the birth of Joseph. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. So she knew this was coming. It was a prophecy. Now, this is another example of things coming about in God's timing. So Benjamin is the baby boy. Still, you understand that, right? Okay. <laughs> we had a... We had a, uh, how would we say that, uh, case of neurological flatulence a few weeks ago trying to determine that. But anyway, <laughs> Benjamin is a baby boy. So I know Israel was thankful. However, he just lost the love of his life. This was the woman he worked years to be able to marry. And it's a big hit for anyone to take. Uh, I told you this, uh, you know, the, the, that this part of the chapter is different. There's no mention here of a time of grieving or how hard Israel or Jacob took it. The Bible just says that she was buried on the way to Bethlehem and Jacob marked her grave. The grave was still known at the writing of this portion of Genesis. So I'm sure that the typical funeral took place here. I can't say that the normal grieving process, which took a while in Hebrew culture, I don't know if that happened or not because they are on the side of the road. But I do know there was probably some time of grieving. It just isn't, isn't recorded. Once again, some of these things we have to fill in from the cultural context. After the funeral and all that that entailed, the family continues to move south. Verse 21, Then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the town of Eder. And it happened when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah. His father's concubine, I told you they're dysfunctional. 
And Israel heard about it, all right? And now, you can tell a man wrote this. It is inspired. Don't get me wrong here. And then they just leave you hanging and go on. Now, these are the, the sons of Jacob were 12. And go ahead and give you a roster. Everybody's like, well, what happened? What happened? You know, we'll tune in to the next show. A um, couple of things culturally. Don't think of the word tower here as it's used, is referring to some great structure. It's just a structure used for watching flocks of sheep. Think more of a deer stand, if y'all know what those are, rather than some heaping tower that's a bastion of security or something like that. He just goes out beyond um, where the, uh, the locals were grazing so as not to interfere with their flocks. And it was there that he made camp. While there, Jacob was firstborn Reuben, goes in unto Bilhah, the mother of some of his brothers. Bilhah was Rachel's maidservant. She was given to Jacob. You might remember when Rachel was not, unable to bear children. That was something cultural. Don't try it nowadays. Bilhah held a position of a wife in a sense. And that's what, and so this makes what Reuben did a type of incest, as it were. So we don't see Jacob dealing with it here, but it will be dealt with when? In God's timing, we actually we'll see it in chapter 49. So we roll on with the text, verse, uh, or, well, let me see. Let's go to, I'll just quote 49's beginning in verse 2. It says, Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn. My might in the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. You think, wait a minute, this kid's all messed up. He's messed up worse than a football bat. Why are you praising him like this? Look at verse 4. Unstable as water. Water just seeks the easiest path and it always seeks level. You shall not excel. <clears throat> Why is that? Because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Then he goes on to Simeon and Levi, who are the two brothers that slaughtered all those people after Dinah's uh, assault. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Not, let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel, Judah, you are he whom your brother shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. All right. That's a lot there. And here we see the matter being dealt with along with what Simeon and Levi did that we read about in the last week or so. The blessing was then passed down to Judah. This is a tribe to which Jesus traces his lineage. It could possibly... In that conundrum world of, you know, future, past, fulfilled prophecy and all that kind of stuff, it could possibly have been Reuben's blessing at some point in time. This should be a lesson to all of us that just because we think we have gotten away with something, it doesn't mean that we have. If you look back at your childhood, you will realize that to be true. God didn't forget. He was instructing Israel as he blessed those boys. It's coming back to haunt them. How many blessings have we disqualified ourselves from by being disobedient? And that's not necessarily a quid pro quo. I don't want to think well, you did something wrong so lightning is in your near future. It's not a quid pro quo like that. It's by, being, by disobeying you put yourself outside the will of God and you're kind of off that train. You're kind of outside that protection. You're now in the world of doing something stupid, you understand. How many things have come upon us and then we ask why? Don't stay in that place forever because now you're going to be overthinking every little thing. Oh, goodness, somebody hit my car. God's cursing me. Let me think over the last month, what have I done? Well, there was that time I hit that other lady's car and left before she could get back. Don't, don't go there because you will drive yourself crazy. I don't, I, like I said, I don't want you to think it's quid pro quo. But have we considered that our past may have come back to haunt us? Because we do have to live, even with the grace of God, we still have to live with the consequences of our decisions. Let me clar clarify something here because some people will see God as being vindictive and not gracious. God is not being vindictive at all. 
Go back and see if these boys ever repented of their actions. We also have to know that some things we do just automatically disqualify us from certain blessings or positions. How many times have you seen some public official do something so crazy that he can never be considered for that type of position again, even if he truly repents and apologizes to the world on camera? Now, I'm all about restoration. But there are some times you just disqualify yourself. We disqualify ourselves. Let me put me in it. All right? Is there any wonder that these boys are somewhat damaged after all the strife and the envy we've seen in this household? Jacob and his wives are to blame for much of this. Playing favorites, all the conniving, and this one's in cahoots with that one. I mean, it is a soap opera in that house. And I want you to understand that these are the people God's choosing to use, and this isn't by any means an all-star team we have here. We'll see the roster in a minute. This family isn't being used of God once again because they are better than anyone else, that God is using them simply because he has chosen them by his grace alone, and that follows us. It's no different. We aren't used of God because we are better than anyone else. God wants to use us because he has chosen us and he blesses us and by allowing us to participate in the plan, in the program. That is awesome. You are participating in history. And you say, well, everybody's breathing is participating in history. Yeah, which side of it are you on? You know, are you participating in God's plan or are you participating in, in your own plan? That's the question to ask. So now, right quick, just f- for the sake of, well... I'm not going to go through all that. But the roster of, the all, the, of this not-so-all-star team, because we're running out of time, is, uh, goes from verse 23 through 29. All right? Uh, well, now let's go to verse 27. It says, Then Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, three different names for the same place, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt. Well, I mean, we have the same thing today. It's like we have a couple visiting from Fairhope, Alabama. Well, where I'm from, that's L.A., lower Alabama. We also have a couple visiting from Southern California. Well, to them, L.A. is something else, Los Angeles. You know, but they're from down there on the Redneck Riviera, uh, the folks from lower Alabama. You know, you're, and people argue, some people try to say the East Coast is a Redneck Riviera. No way. You want me to prove it to you? I can so when you go to Gulf Shores or Orange Beach, when you see a four-wheel drive pull in and they're carrying up more beer than luggage, you're on the Redneck Riviera. <laughs> and that's what that is. All right. Verse 28. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years, so Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Now the list of the, the roster there is they're listed there according to their mother. It's more of a legal listing than one of rank or birth order, okay? So don't try to read anything else into it. Jacob now returns to Hebron and his father Isaac. When Jacob finally left his father-in-law up in Haran, he probably felt as though he would never see his father again, but he was still alive. Jacob left Hebron with nothing but a staff. Now, when he's going north to find his wife left nothing but a staff and the clothes on his back. Now he has 12 sons, many flocks. He's a wealthy man, and he has what he needs to fulfill his part of God's plan. And all this time in between him leaving and now is God preparing him and giving him what he needs for that. God, Where God guides, he provides. So he's returned to see his father before he dies. He's able to talk with him and his brother also. Verse 20, and they bury their father. Verse 20 says, Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. Now, he's not giving God an ultimatum. He's simply acknowledging what has essentially already happened. You know, if this if God's so good to me, I know I'm going to follow him. That vow was fulfilled. Now, let me leave you with these questions. What would our lives look like if they were written down in this book? (laughs) Most of us would work very hard to see that it never went into print. (laughs) Would we be as dysfunctional as Jacob's family? Would people see this much envy, strife, and jealousy, and cattiness, and all the other stuff going on? 
Will they see our children going off the deep end? Killing entire villages, hopefully not. Will they see us following in the, path, uh, in the fate, I should say, of our parents, whatever that may be, good or bad? Would they see our children following in our steps? Think about that. You're in God's plan at that point in time. You're going to be put into the book. Now, they don't know this. They don't know. They know they're part of God's plan. They don't know that 3,000 years later, we're all going to be sitting around critiquing their every move and, and all that sort of thing. But I imagine if we were in this book that people would see a lot of ups and downs, good days, bad days, Good times, bad times. Led Zeppelin, okay. They would see us grow in spurts. They'd probably see us from times get weary and preoccupied with the things of this world just as Jacob did. Because once again, there's nothing new under the sun. All things are common among men. So, the way we have to counter this, if we do live our lives as if it's being, and it is being written down, just not in a book published down here. Let's pray that we be filled with the Spirit daily. And that is a lifestyle, not an event, being filled with the Spirit. Okay? Because we leak. And you'll be filled at the beginning of the day. By the end of the day, sometime if your commute is long, and by the, end, by the time you get to work, you've already leaked down. Do we, so we have to... We have to pray the, to the Lord that we would go uh, over, that we would walk in the Spirit so as not to fulfill the lust of the flesh. So as you go through this week, I ask you to think about what it would be to have your life cataloged in the bestseller of all time for the world to see. What would you want changed, edited, redacted, the CIA to black it out, that sort of thing. Even if we file for the Freedom of Information Act, don't put that in there. You know what I'm saying? What would you want to see? What would you want changed? And then, when you've figured out what you don't want in there, ask God to change you so that those things can change. God knows what our lives are like. And that doesn't necessarily disqualify us, but it allows us to see God's grace at work, that he's chosen us, and still, in spite of us, wants to use us to help, most likely, not our, just ourselves, but someone else. Would you all bow your heads, please? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just come to you today in the name of Jesus. Father, we just thank you for uh, our visitors today, Lord. We pray that they felt welcome, Lord God, and that they would, uh, those that are in the area, Lord God, would choose to make this their church home, Father. But... We also, Lord God, know that uh, we're up and down just like this family. Good days, bad days, good months, bad months, on the train, off the train, on the wagon, off the wagon. So many times, Lord, we're filled one day, we're empty the next. Um, we get caught up in things. That's the way it is and that's life. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way or that bad. Father, you've given us the empowerment and the ability to live in that victory. That even though we're not immunized from tragedy, Lord, we can cope with it. Lord, for that when we need the help and the extra support, there are others in this body that come alongside of us and they bear our burdens and they help hold us up and we in turn help them when they go through that time of need. Father, that's just how the body works. We are there to support each other. When one leg is, is bad, the other side, the whole body adjusts to compensate. And that's how we work with each other, Lord God. And we just thank you for that ability and the love, the agape love you give us that allows us to help in that sense. But Father, I do ask that we would think about what would we have changed? What would, what would we like to edit and redact? And Lord, ask you to come into those specific places in our lives to change us from the inside out. To give us the wisdom to make the right decisions when tempted by those things. But Father, most of all, I just thank you that you're with us, that you guide us, and you use us. You don't forget anything. Everything is dealt with. And that makes you reliable. And Father, we just thank you that 
even though we are not what you need, we are who you want. And by your grace, you've chosen us. Father, I just ask that we would go forth in that knowledge today and enjoy your presence, and that we would be filled with your spirit, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Spirit, Father.